Before we start this review, I just want to apologize to y'all for being gone for so long. Long story short, life hit me pretty hard these last several months. But I'm better now, and I think it's time that me and this here mutt get back to doing what we do best. So without further ado, let's get to the review now. folks, Doom. Yes, Doom, the big motherfucker of FPS games. To those of y'all on the outside looking in, Doom may seem like an archaic FPS from the 90s, but I can assure you, it's far more than what it seems. One thing is that this game was the beginning of a lot of things online FPS players have nowadays. Team Deathmatch, Capture the Flag, Free For All, it all started here. Then there's the single player campaign, but in order to really understand Doom, we're going to have to go back to the past, back to the release of Wolfenstein 3D. Now, as I mentioned in my review for Wolf 3D, that was the title that kickstarted the FPS genre. It also bought industry recognition to the company that made it, id Software. However, the team behind Wolf 3D, more specifically John Carmack and John Romero, wanted to create something even grander. After Wolf 3D's release, and during and after Spear of Destiny's production, Carmack and Romero took to their privacy and began working on a new game engine. The engine in question would come to be known as id Tech 1. For its time, the id Tech 1 engine was quite revolutionary. It implemented a lot of new features that the Wolfenstein 3D engine just simply couldn't do. Not without heavy modification, anyway. <clears throat> Rise of the Triad. The game that Carmack and Romero had in mind for this new engine was actually a licensed game based off the Aliens franchise. When the idea was pitched to 20th Century, they were initially interested, but there was an issue. Fox wanted to have almost exclusive control over the game's development, leaving Carmack, Romero, and the rest of the team discontent. Suffice to say, the idea for an Aliens FPS was scrapped so that both the Johns and the rest of the devs could have more creative freedom. Still keeping to a sci-fi idea like Aliens, the devs had also started drawing inspiration from the two horror movies Evil Dead and Dead Alive. They even drew a little bit of inspiration from the tabletop role-playing game Dungeons & Dragons, as the team were known to play sessions of D&D quite a bit, and the DM, whom I'm willing to bet was Romero, often pitted players against demon enemies. Most of the sprites were drawn on paper first, but some actually had sculptures created so that they could be digitized into the game. For Doom's music and sound effects, Bobby Prince, whom had previously worked with the team on Wolfenstein 3D and Spear of Destiny, was hired again. Mr. Prince got the idea for Doom's music from Romero, who had given him several heavy metal vinyl records, one of which was from the band Slayer. After reaching its developmental completion, Doom, like Wolf 3D before it, was released as a shareware product. And it did not take long for the gaming masses to jump on it. Hell, sometimes it was even bundled along with Wolf 3D, thus putting it in the hands of even more gamers. Finally, during the Christmas season of 1993, the retail version of Doom was finally put on shelves. And gamers the world over loved it. I remember Doom. Fuck yeah, I remember Doom. I remember because it, along with Wolf 3D, were the only games that my parents didn't allow me, my brother-in-law, or my sister to play. Eventually, though, my brother did find out what the parental code was, and we, along with my sister, played the hell out of them. Doom especially. <laughs> Let's go take a look at Doom now. Oh, 
Uh, one thing though, the version of Doom that Shasta and I are playing is Ultimate Doom. We're reviewing that version because he and I are both in agreement that it's more of a complete package. The one thing that I want to compliment first and foremost is the graphics. I notice some of y'all these visuals seem pretty dated, especially by today's standards, but for its era, these graphics are really something to behold. Unlike in Wolf 3D, the walls, floors, and ceilings in Doom are all texture mapped. This makes the game look far more prettier. Another thing that's done visually is how everything is non-grid based. You see, in Wolf 3D, everything had to be placed at a 90 degree angle. But in Doom, however, walls and other things can be set at any angle, at any position. There's also some variable lighting going on in some of these levels, giving off that eerie kind of feeling of being alone with monsters ready to get you in the dark. Gotta hand it to that id Tech 1 engine, back in the day it was quite capable of doing some really impressive stuff with the graphics. Now to be fair, there were other games out there, namely Shadowcaster and Ultima Underworld, where they experimented with texture mapped walls and ceilings, non-grid based placements and variable lighting, but they were merely testing the waters. The id Tech 1 engine took these graphical features that were, for the most part, just being played with, and ran with them. Hell, the modding community still fiddles around with it from time to time, bringing us stuff like Aliens Doom and the oh-so-unholy Brutal Doom. <laughs> minor part of the game, but some of you folks know me, I gotta mention the story. Oh, spoiler warning. Like most games that had John Carmack as one of the devs, the story in Doom is quite minimalistic and basic. That's not a bad thing though. Carmack, Romero, and the other devs wanted to emphasize more on the gameplay anyway. Not to mention, the emphasis really should be on Doom's gameplay because that's what made it so revolutionary. But despite all that, the plot in this game is actually pretty damn good. You take control of Doom Guy, yes, that's his name, the Earth's toughest marine, and he's been stationed on a science-slash-military base on the Martian moon of Phobos. There, scientists are experimenting with interdimensional travel, and have just recently created several dimension gates. The project on the dimension gates proves to be quite dangerous, showing signs of malfunction. However, the scientists press on with their experiments. One day, disaster strikes as the dimension gates start going haywire, and monsters from hell start pouring out through them. The Phobos base, along with another science-slash-military installation on the neighboring moon of Deimos, get completely overran by demonic forces. Many scientists and military personnel are killed, and those that aren't are quickly turned into demonic zombies. Being the only human left, Doom Guy takes it upon himself to fight the legions of hell and get back to Earth. After going through countless hordes of demons, Doom Guy ends up in the underworld itself, where he must now face his greatest challenges. The battle in hell is long and torturous, but through sheer perseverance and willpower, Doom Guy defeats hell's final legion and returns home, only to find out that the demons have now begun an invasion of Earth setting the stage for the inevitable sequel to this game, Doom 2. I really dig the plot for Doom. It's basic, sure, but basic story does not always equate bad story. I also like how they presented the ending. I think the devs knew this game was going to be a hit, and naturally, gamers would want more. <laughs> Remember how in Wolf 3D you would pick from a series of episodes before starting a level? Well, you do that here, too. Episode 1, Knee Deep in the Dead, is where your adventure begins. Knee Deep in the Dead is the easiest out of the four episodes and has the least amount of enemies. 
Episode 2, The Shores of Hell, is where the difficulty starts to amp up a bit. Visually, this is also where you can start to see the demonic corruption in what would otherwise be another military-slash-laboratory base, just like in Episode 1. Episode 3, Inferno, takes place in Hell itself. The difficulty here is pretty tough, but doable. This happens to be my favorite in the four episodes. I can see that the devs really gave it their all when it came to designing the levels for this place. Inferno would be where it all ends, but since we're reviewing Ultimate Doom, we have a fourth additional episode, Thy Flesh Consumed. And holy hell are the levels here hard. Inferno might put your skills to the test, but this? This is where shit really gets serious. There's a lot of teleporting enemies in this episode. A room here may look empty, but the moment you walk into it is the moment you're swarmed. There's also far more hidden rooms and such in Thy Flesh Consumed, so if you really want to ace everything in this episode, I suggest you go on the internet and look up some maps of the levels that show you where the secrets are at. I guess you could say I'm a bit of a sucker for titles that are episodic like Doom. Games more specifically FPS games, just don't seem to do that anymore. It's, as they say, an old school feature that's gone by the wayside in modern times. Anyway, the main hero for this game, Doom Guy, is awesome. Now, if you're new to this franchise and you think Doom Guy is going to have some kind of personality, well, I hate to burst your bubble, but he doesn't. Though, all things concerned, that's actually a good thing. Yeah. Turns out having a blank slate for Doom's protagonist is a positive. You see, the devs made Doom Guy in such a way so that you not only feel like you're controlling a badass, but that you yourself are that badass. In other words, Doom Guy can have pretty much whatever personality you want him to have, because he essentially is you. That's the defining thing that makes Doom Guy awesome. He's an extension of the player. True, there were games that kinda did characters like this before, i.e. Link from the Zelda series, but even there, Link still has his own unique personality, at least in my opinion. Doom Guy, though, is where this video game character type became popular. The devs were clever when they decided to make Doom Guy this way, because it made Doom more immersive, and immersive features are always good. <laughs> Another thing that makes Doom so great is all the different types of enemies to fight. As I mentioned earlier, the devs played sessions of Dungeons and Dragons and watched the movies Evil Dead and Dead Alive, and a lot of their ideas for enemies came from those. You have the common enemies, such as the zombie men and their tougher cousins, the shotgun guys. Not much to say about these enemies other than that they're very, very common, and they kind of make up the bulk of Hell's army. Another common enemy you'll come across are the imps. I don't know why, and call me crazy, but to me, these guys look like dudes in brown and spiked gimp suits. They throw fireballs at you, and if you get too close, they'll slash at you with their claws. Though, like the zombie men and shotgun guys, they're pretty easy to take down. Next up, we have the pinky demons. Once a pinky has you in his sights, he charges in an attempt to bite you. They take quite a beating, so when you face these dudes, make sure to back up once they get too close to you. Going down the list, we have the Kaka Demons. Now, since I'm a little bit into D&D myself, I actually know which monster this demon is based off of. And that demon would be the Beholder, a lawful evil creature that's been featured in every edition of Dungeons & Dragons since AD&D 1. Like the imps, the cacodemons will shoot fireballs at you, and their fireballs pack far greater of a punch than an imp's. Strafing and shooting is the key to bringing these bad boys down. The last bounty on the list are the Lost Souls. 
Now, these guys are pretty damn weak compared to their other demon brethren, but what they lack in strength they make up for in numbers. You don't just encounter one or two lost souls, more like five or six, or even more. Like the pinkies, once a lost soul sees you, he lunges headlong after you for an attack. And these little bastards are fast, so backing away from them is not an option. Fortunately, Lost Souls are not very tough, so once you see one, just start pumping it full of lead. There is one other enemy in this game called the Spectre, which happens to be semi-invisible. But the silhouette of this monster doesn't lie. That's a pinky demon that just happens to be really translucent. You fight it the same way you would a regular pinky. With Satan's forces roaming about, there's definitely going to be a chain of command. There are a total of three bosses to face at the end of each episode, and one of them repeats for thy flesh consumed. Your first boss fight pits you against the Barons of Hell. These guys are pretty easy, all you gotta do is strafe around them and shoot. Do be wary though of their plasma balls, cause those things are much faster than a regular fireball, and whatever you do, don't get too close to them. They'll slash at you. The boss that you'll face in Shores of Hell is the Cyber Demon. The Cyber Demon is very strong and he's got a look to match. Like many other baddies, he shoots a projectile at you. But unlike those many other baddies, the Cyber Demon's projectile is far more powerful. In fact, I'd go so far as to say that it's probably the strongest in the game. Circle strafing and shooting is your friend when it comes to fighting this guy though do remember to back away from him every so often. The third and final boss that you fight against is the Spider Mastermind, aka the Spider Demon. Not to sound like some weirded out fanboy, but god damn it do I love the way the devs made this guy look. However, there is a slight, very minuscule downside to the Spider Demon. He's ridiculously easy to kill if you have a particular gun and it's fully loaded. Though, to be honest, that whole downside is completely avoidable. Just depends on what gun you use. You ultimately fight the Spider Mastermind again in Thy Flesh Consumed, and to me, that was a good decision on the dev's end. He may not be as strong as a Cyber Demon, but he sure is more intimidating looking than the Cyber Demon. I know, I know, I only like the spider demon for superficial reasons. But can you blame me? He kinda reminds me of Krang from Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. Maybe that's why I like him so much. So with the forces of the underworld all too willing to swallow your soul, you're going to have to defend yourself. Fortunately, there's an ample amount of firearms at your disposal. Doom really went all out when it came to giving its players weapons. Again, it was the devs wanting the consumer to feel like a badass. The game gives you a choice of eight weapons to pick from. Today for FPS games, that's not a lot. But for an early 90s FPS, that was almost too many. Think about it, Wolf 3D only had about four weapons in total, and really only three were of any use. Doom, on the other hand, gives you a wider assortment of stuff to kill enemies with. The first weapon that you start with is a pistol. This gun is actually based off the real-life Beretta 92FS. I've never tried that gun out when I've gone to my local range, so I don't know how powerful it truly is in real life. But in Doom, the pistol is pretty handy. It's enough to take out standard zombies and imps, but with bigger enemies such as cacodemons and pinkies, you'll want to use something better. Obviously. The second weapon, and the one that you'll mostly be using throughout your playthrough of this game, is the shotgun. This weapon is going to be your best buddy, and here's why. The shotgun is effective as mostly a close quarters gun, but it's also a bit effective at longer range. Granted, at longer distances, the bullets are less effective than what they would be up close, so keep that in mind. 
Coming up at weapon number three, we have a freaking chainsaw. That is just one of the coolest things ever put in a video game. This was a reference to Ash's chainsaw in the Evil Dead movies. Since it's a melee weapon, it's mandatory for you to use it within mere inches of an enemy. That's not a bad thing though, because once you rev this chainsaw up, it usually cancels out at any attack from an enemy of which you're using it on. Be warned, because there are a few exceptions to that rule. Some enemies will attack regardless of whether you're using the chainsaw on them or not. But it's hella effective on zombies, imps, and especially pinkies. Weapon number four is the chain gun. Now I know what you're thinking, this is going to be an uber powerful weapon like it was in Wolf 3D. Well, technically it is, but technically it's also a fully automatic version of the pistol. Which means it's great to use on some enemies, but on the bigger guys... They tend to be bullet sponges for this thing. Though, it is great that the chain gun uses the same ammo as the pistol. That means ammo is plentiful. Moving on down to weapon number five, we have the mighty rocket launcher. Now this is a powerful firearm. It's as cool as you can imagine a rocket launcher to be in a video game. It does massive amounts of damage, and it's perfect to use against bosses. It's good to use on regular enemies too, if you want to conserve on other ammo or if you want to clear out a section of the map real fast. Be warned though, the rocket launcher is not a close quarters weapon like all the others. You will take damage if you're close enough to a rocket's explosion, so be cautious. Number six on the list of weapons is the plasma gun. Think of an assault rifle, but one that shoots energy rather than bullets. It's a fantastic weapon to use against enemies, because it can kill them real fast. Another reason for why this is such a cool weapon is because you just don't see firearms like this very often in FPS games. Unless, of course, we're talking about Halo. However, it should be known that, like the shotgun, the plasma gun is less effective against enemies that are further away from you. So, make sure to be kind of close to bad guys for better results. The seventh, and most powerful weapon that you can wield in this and any other Doom game is the legendary BFG 9000. That's right, the BFG. The big fucking gun. Want to clear out a room that's filled to the brim with demons? BFG 9000. Want to practically make a boss your bitch? BFG 9000. Want to just go crazy and run around in a level whilst in god mode and just kill anything that moves? BFG 9000. This weapon is so prolific that pretty much every FPS game has one. There's always going to be a firearm or what have you in an FPS that just that's just super powerful and trumps everything else. Doom is where that originated. The BFG might be overpowered, but it sure is hella fun to use. Granted, like the other weapons, there is a drawback. Since the BFG is the most powerful weapon in the game, it uses an insane amount of ammo. In fact, you can only fire about seven shots, and that's only if you're fully loaded with ammo. As such, the BFG is not meant to be used all the time unless you're in god mode. So when you do use it, make sure to use it sparingly. Technically, there's one more weapon to talk about, and that would be your bare-ass fists. Punching does about as much damage as you'd imagine it to do against a fucking demon. That is unless you're using a particular power-up that makes your punches when it killers. But that said power-up is really hard to find, so yeah. Don't use your fists. You know, one thing I've noticed about Doom is how good the soundtrack for it is. Leave it to good old Bobby Prince to do the music for an FPS. That man has some honest-to-god talent. Though I do suppose it helps when one of your colleagues lends you a few of his heavy metal records. And that's the thing that I absolutely freaking love about Doom's soundtrack. It's so metal. Some of the tunes are fast-paced and energetic, a la thrash metal-inspired, and some are slower and more methodic, a la Doom metal-inspired. <laughs> 
You know, funny enough, that last part kind of makes sense. The game is called Doom, after all, so they might as well have some songs in there that sound like they came from Doom metal bands. In all, there are 24 separate tunes. Here are four that happen to be my personal favorites. In a way, Mr. Prince kind of spoiled us gamers. The music in Doom is what I would call timeless video game music, right up there with the tunes in games such as Sonic 2 or even Mega Man 2. Though, perhaps I'm over-complimenting everything. That's probably because I'm a metalhead and I'm just nerding out over the music. that Doom offers to gamers is yet another great aspect. If you're a newcomer to Doom, or to FPSs in general, the option is there to play on less difficult settings. But if you're a veteran FPS player, I think that you'll get a far more enjoyable experience if you play on the setting Hurt Me Plenty or higher. If you want it to be, Doom can be a very, very challenging game, especially if you're playing on the Nightmare difficulty, on that setting, enemies will respawn, meaning that you almost have to be constantly moving or you'll end up dead. True, Wolf 3D is where these varying difficulty options started, but it was here in Doom where it actually got noticed. This feature makes Doom very flexible. Both a casual player and a hardcore player can play this game. I really like that because a lot of classic games, not all, but a lot, are either easy or hard, and there's very little in the way of a gray area, if any, sometimes. Folks, we've gone over everything we pretty much could for old Doom. All that's left to do now is give you all my final thoughts, and of course, give the grade. I love Doom. I really do. It's almost a perfect game. But as many of you folks know, no such thing exists. But truth be told, I couldn't really find much of anything that I thought could be a negative for this game. Well, I take that back, I did find one thing, but honestly, it's real nitpicky on my end. Two enemies in particular have a tendency to piss me off, and those two enemies are the Lost Souls and the Spectres. I don't like the fact that the Lost Souls can pretty much dogpile your ass and kill you. Granted, a lot of that can come from being unprepared. If you see a Lost Soul, always expect there to be more. And as for the Spectres, well... They piss me off because they have a tendency to take you by surprise. Because they're semi-invisible, as well as translucent, 
90 times out of 100, you'll never see these guys coming. That is until you notice that you're taking damage and whoop, there's a specter biting at you. But like I said, this is more of my own personal nitpick. Other than that, Doom is an awesome game. It took what Wolfenstein 3D did and perfected it tenfold, and Wolf 3D was already an awesome game itself. I consider Doom a must-buy. If you love FPS games, you will want to own this title. Hell, I'd even suggest it to those that aren't even really into FPSs, and I can definitely suggest it to newcomers to the genre. If for nothing else, the gameplay alone for Doom should be enough for y'all to consider it. To me, this is a game that needs to be experienced in order to fully grasp why it's so good. My words can only explain so much. I could ramble on and on about how Doom is such a great title, but that's why I say, go and play this game. It may be my own personal bias, because I did grow up with it, but I'm not the only one. There are many famous YouTubers out there such as GGG Man Lives, General Lots, and LGR who love and revere this game as much as I do. And really, what's there not to love about Doom as well as the entire franchise in general? Doom has stood the test of time, and people still talk about it to this day. It's so prolific that the modding community for it is still thriving and has been since 1993. So what are you folks waiting for? The forces of hell ain't gonna kill themselves. Well, with all said and done, I give Doom its rightful grade of A for awesome. And if I could, I'd probably give it a higher grade. Though, it's come to my attention that I probably heaped far too much praise on this game, and I'm well aware that for some, it hasn't aged quite well. So, to balance everything out in this review, I asked my friend and colleague Dylan Tomasi to give a second opinion. Hello, Redneck, and thank you so much for having me. And I would like to thank you so much for your help on Edmonton Behind the Mic. Hello everybody, this is D-Laps, and I'm here to review Doom on PS1. Now one of my favorite genre of video games would have to be sci-fi horror, like Dead Space, Evil Within, The Suffering, but Doom is definitely a lot older than all those games. It's like the original kind of sci-fi horror game. and. Overall, I'm gonna have to say it's it's okay to play, but it's not really that fun. It reminds me of Wolfenstein because it's the exact same engine, and I, I find that kind of boring. But it is cool when you're running around and blowing things up and killing stuff, and it has a cool feel to it. But overall, man, I, I just I just don't like it too much. It's probably because I'm not really down with that whole arena battle thing. Because that's all it is. You're put in a room and you have to take out a bunch of enemies super quickly. Even the new Doom that just recently came out feels exactly the same. It just looks brutal. And I don't mean looks brutal as it looks crappy. I mean it just it looks so realistically gory. It's it's insane. But this game doesn't have that appeal. It has as cool like you know effects, but. Like when you shoot an enemy with your shotgun, it kind of does that little splatter. You see the enemy keel over. You know, it looks good yeah. for a first-person shooter from the 90s, I guess. But I don't know, man. I'm all about narrative. But that's where this game kind of sucks because it doesn't really have a narrative. It has rooms that you go into. And you shoot five enemies, and then you go into the next room. Now, I remember a while back, I did a review for Wolfenstein for Redneck where I said the controls were really difficult, but I've gotten a controller, like a special controller for my cell phone, so when I play these ROMs on it, I don't have to use the touch screen. So it made the controls a lot easier this time. And that's usually my pet peeve on games, is how I control the game. And I would have to say, with that controller, it made the game very smooth and it worked very well. Also, I found playing the game that the frame rate was very smooth. And, and the motion of everything was, is actually very nice. So if I had to rate this masterpiece, this game that changed everything, basically defined first-person shooters, I would give it a 4. Alright, well, 
All right, well, that's my two cents on Doom. I'd like to thank Redneck for letting me be on his channel. Thank you very much. And uh, have yourself a great day, everybody. And please, check out Edmonton Behind the Mic if you have a spare moment. Well, that was Dylan Tomasi, folks. And don't forget to check out his channel. I'll leave a link in the description below. Well, Shast, do you have any parting words for our good audience? And you were right. You were right. Since we didn't have good luck this year, again, with timing when it came to FPS time, I decided to cancel it and just review FPS games whenever the hell I please. So with that, I bid you watchers out there a goodbye, and y'all come back now, all right?